Let's turn in our Bibles this evening to the book of Ephesians in the New Testament, chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, we are studying together the answer to the question, how does Jesus Christ build his church? We've seen that Jesus Christ is the one who builds his church, and we want to see from his word, God tells us, not our ideas, not man's ideas, not some board or some think tank. We want to know what saith the Lord about how he builds his church. One of the things we're trying to bring these things into by way of application is can God use a small church like ours? Can God do that? Now in one sense, the answer is as simple as your view and understanding of God. How big is your God? There's no limit to what God can do. So it's easy to get that answer right if you have an understanding of who God is. But he tells us in his word and we want to be equipped we want to be equipped with understanding, so how does God do it? Because there's lots of small churches like ours who are not necessarily made up the way we might think of a church, especially if you're a little bit older and have an idea in your head from what we've seen a couple decades ago. Things have changed among churches that are serious about what God says. Things have changed for us. Does that mean God is no longer able? I could ask it in a biblical way. Is God's arm shortened that he cannot save? But we need to know what he says so that we can be in the right and proper place that God might use us. And so Ephesians chapter 4, notice please verse 11. I'm going to read down to verse 16 of Ephesians 4. And he himself, it's intensive, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. If you don't think they're out to get us, just check Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14 again. <laughs> Satan is using every means he can, verse 15, but speaking the truth in love. May grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what? Every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Let's pray. Father, we look to you for your hand of blessing, growth, establishment, upon this assembly, and we pray for other assemblies, like-minded assemblies who are serious about wanting to be used by you. Thank you, Lord, that your arm is not shortened, that it cannot save. For you are able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think according to the power that works in us. And we seek, Father, to understand your wisdom in this important matter of your plan for this age, the church the body of Christ, which is centered and realized in our lives in the local assembly. I pray that you'll bless local assemblies and use local assemblies to further the name and the testimony of Jesus Christ to the glory of God. I pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. In this particular study heretofore, we have looked at apostles and we have looked at prophets, and tonight we want to look at evangelists. Apostles used by God, hand-selected by Jesus Christ, and uh, they were the ones who uh, ministered together with the Lord Jesus. They 
uh, except for the Apostle Paul, they lived, they ate, they ministered together, they slept with and journeyed with the Lord Jesus Christ, and they gave to us the New Testament. They went forward preaching the gospel, and God used several of them to pen the pages of Scripture. This now brings, of course, the Apostle Paul into the picture, uh, probably the largest writer, human writer, the Holy Spirit's the author of God's Word, but Paul one chosen out of due time is how he described himself. And yet, when he met the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, he became a follower of Christ and an apostle, one who was sent. And they were, we saw in Ephesians 2, 19 and 20, a part of the foundation of the church. Jesus is the foundation, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. But a part of that foundation is the apostles and prophets, chiefly we've seen because... God used them to give New Testament revelation, the truth that we find on the pages of New Testament scripture. Now we have evangelists, and we want to look at that word evangelist tonight. The word itself, evangelist, is the word that means one who brings good news. In the New Testament, the word evangelist is one who proclaims the gospel of the grace of God. Vines, in his New Testament dictionary, breaks the word up. The Greek word is euangelistes. Not that that's important, except I want you to hear that word you in the beginning. That you means good. It's somebody who is bringing good. The angelistes comes from angelos. Does that sound like angels? Yeah, the word angel is not limited to the spirit beings that God created that according to Hebrews 1, do his bidding, they're his ministers, a flame of fire, because the word angel just means a messenger, someone who carries a message, someone who does the bidding of the one who sent them. And there are angels proper, we know the names of a few, Gabriel and Michael the archangel, we know the names of a couple of the angels. And by the way, maybe that's what we're gonna do in heaven is get to meet all those innumerable angels. You will have something to tell them, I hope. They will want to hear the message of how God's redemption changed your life. They will want to hear that. Isn't that something? Hebrews chapter 1, they look with interest on those who are the heirs of salvation. The grace of God. Mm, it's amazing. But the word angel can just mean a messenger. Somebody sent with a message. And so this is a messenger of good. Uh, somebody who brings good in the New Testament, somebody who brings the good news. Now, the word gospel is built on a similar type frame of word. It's the euangelion. An evangelist is the euangelistes. The gospel is the euangelion. That was easy for me to say, wasn't it? That's good news. That's what the gospel is. But in the New Testament, it's the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ, who died on the cross and shed his blood to save us from his, our sins. And so, an evangelist, as we understand from our church history in America, is somebody who's a specially gifted man and bringing the good news, who bringing the gospel. And there have been, and I believe still are, those who are specially gifted and presenting the good news of the gospel. Now, we're going to see tonight... All of us have the responsibility to share the good news. We all do. If you've been saved, you have something very special to tell people. But God has given to the church special ones who are gifted to share that good news. And they have a divine gift and a divine enablement, a, a, an outworking of the Spirit of God through them to tell people the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. Let's meet one of these men. Let's go to the book of Acts chapter 21. Acts chapter 21, there are some familiar names, you're going to know it, but we don't talk about them too often. Tonight we want to talk about one of those in Acts chapter 21 in verse 8. Speaking about the Apostle Paul as he's journeying back to Jerusalem, and on his way we're told in verse 8 of Acts 21, on the next day we who were Paul's companions, by the way when you read that wording, every word's important, we who were, who does that include? Luke, right, we. He is using the personal pronoun identifying he was together with Paul and there were some others as Paul was traveling back to Jerusalem. Uh, Luke is telling us we who were 
Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered into the house of whom? Philip the evangelist. All right, here's our word. That's the word. He gave some evangelists. Here's one, Philip the evangelist. Now notice, who was one of the seven and stayed with him. So Philip, this evangelist, was glad to have Paul and his companions stay with them in his home. You know it's a tremendous blessing to have missionaries stay in your home. What a joy and a privilege it is to have missionaries come and to take care of whatever needs they are. Maybe you're just providing a meal for them. Maybe you're having them overnight. Maybe you're just taking them down to gas up their car and send them on their way. What a privilege it is and a joy and an opportunity for fellowship. And here Philip is having the privilege of having the Apostle Paul. I think for the Apostle Paul, it was a privilege to be in the home of Philip the Evangelist. What? I wish I could have been there for that fellowship time. Listen, heaven's going to be grand. Philip's going to be there. Paul's going to be there. What's it going to be like when God hosts us in his home? All of us. Here's Philip, the evangelist. Now, Philip is uh, one of the seven. Who are the seven? Turn back to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. This is uh, an identification that Luke is assuming you know exactly what he's referring to because you've been reading his book carefully, this history of the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the apostles. Acts chapter 6, please notice verse 5. There was a problem in the church there in Jerusalem, and it was ministering to all the widows, taking care of all of them, not just some of them. The apostles needed to remain faithful to the teaching of the word of God and prayer. They wouldn't leave that ministry. And so uh, there was a need to set aside some men who could serve. Verse 5, And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit. Number two, and Philip. Here's Philip. He's one of the first original deacons chosen to serve, ministering to the needs of the saints. Now, I want you to notice that these men, Stephen, Philip, Procaner, uh, uh, Nicanor, Parmenas, and Nicholas, and the others. These were spiritual men. Uh, they served very physical needs, waiting on tables for widows. That's just a physical need, taking care of their physical needs. But they were spiritual men. They were men who were gifted and serious about studying the Word of God and proclaiming the Word of God. Philip, this evangelist, was one of the seven. And let's go to chapter 8, Acts chapter 8, and just want to be reminded of Philip being used of the Lord mightily in the job of doing what God called him to do, which was what? Well, serve tables. <laughs> do you, but not only serve tables, notice here in Acts chapter 8, I want to begin in verses 5 through 7. Uh, in verses 5 through 7, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. That's what a euangelist does. He preaches the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. And notice the multitudes with one multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles he did. And, and some of those are described in verse 7, even as Jesus promised, it's recorded in Mark 16, the apostles here and evangelists, these first ones who brought the gospel, their ministry of preaching and teaching would be accompanied by miraculous events. Now we saw in 1 Corinthians 13 that would fade away and pass away as God's word was completed. Now we have authority established, and that authority is not in the person, it's in the word, the word of God. And each and every one of us can examine the speaker by the word of God that we have completed. But notice in verse 8, there was great joy in that city. Why? Many of the Samaritans trusted in Jesus Christ as their savior. And so here's Philip, and he's preaching the gospel of salvation in Jesus Christ, and he's specially gifted. There's many people who are coming to know Jesus Christ as Savior. Later on in this chapter, beginning in verse 26, we see that an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise, go toward the south along the road, which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. Whew! Are you excited about that ministry? Philip, I'm sending you to the desert. I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord. I'll go wherever it is. That's what Philip had a heart. It takes a heart and a willingness to go where God wants you to go if you're going to serve the Lord. We don't choose the place of our going. God chooses where we go. And by the way, Philip served tables 
before he preached the gospel. Isn't that something? We need to be faithful in ministry if God's going to use us to use and deal with the deeper spiritual matters. That's important. Can you be faithful in serving a table, sweeping the floor, I don't know, taking care of whatever physical things need to be taken care of? You can be sure God will entrust the faithful servant in the little things to give the weightier matters of his spiritual truth, such was the case with Philip. And Philip was willing to go. I'll go where you want me to go, Lord, down into the desert. Verse 27, so he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship And he was returning, so he was a proselyte. Here he was a man of high office in this kingdom in Ethiopia. He was a Gentile, but he was a proselyte. He had converted to Judaism. Uh, Very similar to, just a little later on, we're going to hear about Cornelius, the Italian uh, centurion, another believer in Jehovah. Were they saved? Now that Jesus Christ has come, God has come in the flesh, and Christ died on the cross and shed his blood to pay for our sins and rose again, we need to place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That's important to understand. The gospel is very important. You have to trust in Jesus Christ because Christ came and provided salvation. That's the good news. Christ saves if you will receive him. No, he wasn't saved. As a matter of fact, he was, verse 28, reading Isaiah the prophet. He was reading the word of God. And uh, the spirit said to Philip, go near, overtake his chariot. So Philip ran and he heard him reading from the prophet Isaiah. And he said, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. And the place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of some other man? (laughs) Would you like to know of whom Isaiah the prophet spoke? He opened his mouth. And he began at this scripture, and he preached what? Jesus. Jesus Christ. God who came. God who surely his life was taken from this earth. But I have good news for you. Guess what? Thou wilt not leave his soul in Sheol. No. His body will not see corruption. He was going to rise from the dead. And that's what Jesus did. And the eunuch trusted in Jesus Christ. Notice the eunuch uh, wanted to be baptized. And, and Philip put the question to him, do you believe? If you believe, that's how you're saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul said to the Philippian jailer, and thou shalt be saved. Now, after this, when the chariot came still and he baptized uh, the eunuch, when uh, the eunuch confessed faith in Jesus Christ, notice they went down into the water, verse 38, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, Oh, time for new work for Philip. And I want to point out something about this. Soon as soon as he was done, the eunuch goes away with his Isaiah scroll, but he has something wonderful now. Now he has Christ in his heart, the eunuch. And so he can open up that scroll and he can approach it with a whole new understanding. And Philip is going to be taken away. The Spirit of God leads him on to new ministry. The Spirit of the Lord caught him away so the eunuch saw him no more. And, and so he was sad, began to pout. I can't get on with my Christian life without Philip. No, he went away rejoicing because Christ was in his heart. Isn't that wonderful? And Philip was moved on. Verse 40, Philip was found in Azotus. Then passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to hmm, Caesarea. We're going to hear a lot about that in chapter 10. Amazing. How God used this man. And notice with the evangelist, he's moving on. He's moving on. He's not staying put in one place. God's moving him. God's using an evangelist, a specially gifted man, to proclaim the good news of salvation. And he's God's point man, one of them, if you will, that God can move him around wherever he needs him to do what? Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. In a God-enabled way so that people will understand and trust. Now, people don't get saved because of the evangelist. 
Don't get that in your mind, because then we tend to put ourselves down. Oh, I'm not an evangelist. We're going to see that we all have the responsibility to do the work of an evangelist. What's the job of an evangelist? Proclaim the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter if you're gifted in the same way an evangelist is or not. You have a responsibility, and you have the Spirit of God to help you. And God wants us to do the work of an evangelist. Uh, but God's usually keeping people who are not evangelists put right where you are. God's looking for many more Christians to stay right in your neighborhood, right in your family, right in your place of work. He's got you put here, and he's moving the evangelist around. Isn't that interesting? Evangelists move around, and the Christians typically stay put right here. And God uses them both differently. And like a wise master chess player who understands how the different pieces move, God has different individuals that he is gifted in different ways, and he uses them differently for his purpose, for his glory. Philip was an evangelist. Now, Paul was involved in evangelism. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Now, Paul, we saw, is one of the apostles. He's an apostle, one sent with a message. Uh, we don't record anything of Philip recording or giving New Testament truth. Paul did, Peter did, God used those men. But Philip was an evangelist. But notice here in 1 Corinthians 1, chapter 1 and verse 17, Paul has this to say to the church at Corinth, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Euangelizo, a euangelistes is an evangelist. Euangelion is the gospel. Euangelizo, you guys are all masters at Greek now. <laughs> that's somebody who's just proclaiming the good news. And that's what Paul did. He proclaimed the good news. He proclaimed the gospel. But notice what he said. God called me that I should, and he sent me that I should what? Preach the gospel. Not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Do you have to have the most eloquent and able ability to proclaim the message? Now, we have an eloquent message, but we all differ in our abilities and the way we can present that. The importance is faithfulness to proclaim that message accurately. The Apostle Paul claims that he was not a man who was eloquent of words. And uh, on more than one occasion, he, he differentiated himself from others who had a tremendous gift to speak. Well, Paul may or may not. I don't know. I never heard Paul speak. I've been searching sermonaudio.com, but I haven't found in any messages, audio messages. I just have to read them right here in the scripture. There's plenty of those. <laughs> but Paul was used mightily of the Lord because he was a servant who was faithful to God and available to God. And he preached the word of God faithfully. He was called to do that, preach the gospel. So when you come to Romans chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, you could turn there if you want to. You don't have to. I'm jumping around a little bit tonight. But in Romans chapter 1, I'm sorry, I want verses 14, 15, and 16, Paul writes to the church, to the believers there in Rome, I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. What will make you effective in proclaiming the gospel, because I have no indication that Paul had the gift of evangelism. Maybe he did, I don't know. He's never called an evangelist. He was an apostle. Philip is clearly called an evangelist. He was given that gift. And, uh, but Paul was convinced of the gospel. You get that here, don't you? He understood the dynamic nature and the power. If you believe this message, it will transform your life because God will give you new life, eternal life. This message is able to save your soul. Did Paul concern himself with how people responded to the message? Do you know he didn't? The Jews, by and large, rejected Paul and his message. And there were lots of Gentiles who did too. In one case, Paul shook off the dust off his sandals and said, we'll go to the Gentiles. If you don't want to hear the message, we'll take it to somebody who does want to hear it. He wasn't intimidated 
by how people responded. He understood what? I have a responsibility to proclaim the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. And he understood that if you will receive it in faith, you will be born again. Convinced of the power of the gospel. This message can save your life. And that's what a believer has to be. Convinced of the power of the message. What's the power of the message? It's the person of the message, Jesus Christ. When we preach the gospel, we're preaching a person, Christ wants to save you from your sins, and he will become a part of your life like you just will be blessed abundantly because Christ will come to live within your heart. If you receive him in faith, it's a wonderful message. Paul was convinced of that. Turn to chapter 10, Romans chapter 10, and we see just a little bit of God's plan here because it really, when we think of Ephesians 4.11 and the gift of evangelism, uh, we find an equivalent in missionaries. That's what we use the word today, a missionary. Usually when we think of a missionary, we think of someone who goes to a foreign country and they might have to learn a new language unless they know it. They might have to learn a new culture unless they're from it. But they go to usually a foreign country. Now, we want to be careful. You don't have to have the gift of evangelism to be a missionary. You don't have to. But boy, what a blessing that is. That's a good thing for a missionary, wouldn't you say? If they had the gift of evangelism? Yeah. And God calls some missionaries who have the gift of evangelism, but he calls others who don't have the gift of evangelism. But this is what's important. Romans chapter 10, verse 14. How then, this is speaking of the unsaved, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? If you don't believe, you can't call upon the name of the Lord. Notice the question goes on. How shall they believe in him of whom they've had not heard? That's a big question. A lot of people want to throw at you to try to cause you to stumble. What about the uh, uh, indigenous tribal peoples in some African or Asian country or down in South America or some wildest part of the globe in Papua New Guinea or something like that? How, how are they going to believe if they haven't heard? The answer is they can't. They have the testimony of creation, Romans chapter 1. They have a testimony of their own conscience that God gave them, Romans chapter 2. But guess what? They are responsible with those to understand that there's a God. There's a God who created all these things, including us. And I am responsible with him because I know I ought to do right. I'm going to give an account to him. If they get that far, guess what God's going to do? Let's continue reading. And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are what? Sent. A missionary may have the gift of evangelism. He doesn't have to but he must be sent. That's important. I lived in a time when uh, I was told that everyone should just go. Drop everything and go. I'm not convinced of that. I believe there's a modicum of truth to it. Every one of us should, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, we should be serving the Lord. And we should be telling people the good news, no matter where you are, in your home, in your family, in your school, in your place of employment. We should be telling others the good news as God opens the door. We're looking for that door. We're praying for that door. But there are some that God calls and sends. And that's an important part of it right here. How shall they preach unless they are sent? I want to tell you, there's many who have dropped everything and gone and they found out after a couple of years, they went on their own. God didn't send them. It might have been an emotional plea that was made or something that stirred them up, but it wasn't God that sent them. I believe it's important to be called of God and sent. Romans chapter 10, verses 14 and 15. But notice, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach, here it is, the gospel of peace who bring glad tidings of good things. If there's someone in some far off Papua New Guinea or South America or the deepest jungles of Africa or India or wherever, and there's a heart that wants to know the God who made him, do you know what God does? He sends him a preacher. This is God's word. How shall they believe in whom, him whom they have not heard? If there's a heart who wants to know God, you know what God's going to do? He will send someone. He will, because I know God, and I know what he says in Romans chapter 10. God calls, and he sends, he sends missionaries. 
those who preach the good news. Now, some of them are gifted with evangelism. Let's come back to Ephesians chapter 4, and we'll kind of bring this to a conclusion for tonight. A big part of the church growth is those who are gifted with evangelism, and I want to open that up to missionaries tonight. Aren't you thankful for missionaries? I'm thankful for how God has blessed America with the modern missions movement, which is funny. It's not so modern anymore. <laughs> it got started in the 1800s. Somebody help me. Have you read any good missionary biographies? If you hadn't, haven't, you should read about these missionaries that God called and sent and used marvelous people like William Carey, uh, people uh, like Hudson Taylor, and the list goes on and on of people that God used in a mighty way. I want to tell you, they made great sacrifices in their lives because God causes his servants to suffer before they see how God will work through their life, that they may know, that all may know, it's the Lord who did it. It's a work of God, and he'll use each one, each servant for his own. And God brings forth his good news, and as the seeds are planted, people come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And you know what springs up where people trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior? The New Testament tells us local assemblies. It's just a group of believers in Jesus Christ who've been called out. And so, to conclude it tonight by way of application, we should be supportive of missionaries. It's important. It's a key part of how God wants to spread the good news, both here and abroad. Missions work is truly God's work, and we should have a heart for it. We should be praying for those that God will call and God will send. And we should support and be willing to support those that God has called and God is sending. Why? God uses them in a wonderful way to do what? To build up the body of Christ. And one of the things that we seek to do as leadership here at Crosswoods Bible Church when we talk to missionaries is we want to know how mindful are they of local church ministry? In other words, do they seek to get those believers, people who trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior, organized together as a local assembly and build them up in their most holy faith with the teaching of the word of God so that they can begin to be a living witness and a testimony for Jesus Christ. We're concerned about that. Why? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. He, God himself, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Thank you, Lord. I'm so thankful for the missions movement. I'm so thankful for those that God has specially gifted. And I'm so thankful for the work of the ministry that we have the precious opportunity to do the work of evangelists. I didn't give that passage. That's 2 Timothy 4, 5. Paul wrote to Timothy in his last epistle that we know of that Paul wrote, 2 Timothy 4, 5, and I believe he wrote to a pastor. That's what I believe Timothy was, a pastor. And I don't believe that Timothy was necessarily gifted with evangelism. You know why? Because Paul said to Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. In other words, there should be that looking towards the lost. That's important. We'll talk about that next week together. Why? Well, because the pastor has been burdened with another kind of a ministry that God has given to him. But in being burdened and fulfilling, being faithful for that ministry, he can't lose sight of the work of evangelism. We've got to keep it ever before our eyes. God is concerned that souls would come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. May we be concerned as well. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you that it is your work to save souls and to see in your word how you do that. I pray that these passages of scripture would be precious to our minds and to our hearts and that we will see that you have a plan, you have a program, you have a way that you work and I pray that we will honor you in being faithful, faithful in praying for this kind of a ministry, faithful in supporting this kind of a ministry, faithful in working in this kind of a ministry we pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' name, amen.